Okay, welcome everyone, welcome. Happy Thursday, this is Dr. Selma Bartholomew. This is Dr. B from our partner with Legacy. Thank you so much for joining us for our celebration of Black History Month and, and celebrating Black history and Black excellence. And Dr. B, uh, call your friends, grab your popcorn, and uh, we are ready for an exciting and a, an awesome uh, talk uh, today. Uh, this is actually our first webinar uh, for the new year, and I thank everyone in our community that was calling Dr. B and said, hey, hey, what happened to our Thursdays? So I really sincerely um, appreciate your patience. We've been busy planning a, a, a year, and as we are um, getting on the call and uh, welcoming our audience, I want you to know we have a dynamic uh, panel uh, of artists and educators and leaders in the space today to really give us a context of why uh, Black history is so important. So call your friends, grab your popcorn, and let me uh, welcome <laughs> everyone, um, everyone back. And as the audience, as we kind of get ready to get started, I wanted everyone to know that today I'm, I'm kind of being, I feel like if I'm being a little selfish, and um, I'm selfish because everyone knows, hey, Dr. B, we wear this, I wear this math, math hat, and um, you know, the work we do in schools. But what they may not know about me is that I absolutely love history, uh, love sports, and also I love to travel. And today's show is all about that. So call your friends and thank you so much uh, for uh, making time. Um, we're going to, uh, as always, uh, give our expert panel members an opportunity uh, to introduce themselves. And uh, yes, uh, Dr. Doswell uh, from the Negro Leagues uh, Museum will be joining us. Uh, he just sent me a message that he was finishing up a meeting. So yes, um, he will be um, a part of the panel. So we're looking forward to him. So thank you. When he um, joins, I will uh, introduce him, uh, give him the chance to introduce himself as well to the audience. So happy new year, everyone. And thank you so much for allowing us once again to come into your homes and into your office and continue to stay safe. Um, so to, as we know, it's Black History Month, and it's an opportunity to really reflect on the excellence and to reflect on uh, the experiences of um, African Americans um, in this country, and not only in this country, but also throughout the diaspora. And so we wanted to create an opportunity today to have a conversation with our experts about why it is so important to learn about their experiences and to learn about what inspired them on their careers and on their journey to make a commitment to learning history, uh, to connect into different cultures and to be in a voice and a leader um, in the space. So we have three panel experts today. Um, we have uh, artist and storyteller, Karen E. Griffin. Uh, we, have, we have Dr. Uh, Davo Zilre. And um, I'll give her a chance. And then yes, we will also have Dr. Raymond uh, Doswell. I'm gonna start with asking our artist, um, artist Griffin uh, to introduce herself. Um, I know already that she is a storyteller and a fiber artist. So I asked her to explain certainly the fiber artist piece. Um, and we will also get into the story, the storytelling uh, piece. She is an entrepreneur, an expert and has worked in the in the museum, uh, in the museum uh, space um, as well. And, um, and an owner of uh, Jazzy K Productions. Did I get that right? Yes, mm -hmm. okay. So as you introduce yourself, um, um, artist uh, Griffin, if you can just tell us about your work. And I always like to have an opening question. So I want to ask, what does, um, what does it mean to know uh, Black history? And what is the significant moments in your journey and in our journey as a people that are often kind of forgotten or misunderstood as we kind of uh, get started in this conversation? So welcome and thank you so much for, um, for joining us today. Well, thank you, Dr. B, for starters, for allowing me to have this opportunity to showcase uh, my journey in America as my creative ancestors were making their way right here. So, yes, my name is Karen E. Griffin. E stands for excited, encouraged, educated every day. 
Um, that's what the E stands for. I am the owner of Jazzy K Productions, LLC, and DBA, Art by E. Lewis. So that is my art part. Um, relating back to your question, what have we forgotten? Uh, and especially for me, I'm glad I've had the opportunity to take a leap of faith. And I'm glad I didn't look before I leaped, else I would have not done it. But um, as far as African-Americans in America, I think most of all is that we sometimes have forgotten our culture. We have forgotten our way and our purpose in America. What a lot of people fail to realize at 1619, when our ancestors were put on that slave ship, they thought they were taking something from us. And what they failed to realize, uh, we were very much uh, intelligent because everything was still in our hands, our head, but also in our hands. That's where, that's how America got built is because of what was in our ancestors' head and in our hands and what they failed to realize, we are the seeds of those apple trees. So uh, that's uh, my statement on that. Thank you so much, thank you so much. And um, we will give you a chance to, of course, tell us where to find you. And um, I yes, also asked her to make sure that she gives us a chance to learn about at least one of those <laughs> that she have in that beautiful mosaic, um, you know, uh, wall behind her. And so thank you so much. So our next, our next guest is, um, and I said it was all about me. So I am honored to have a Fordham University uh, graduate, uh, Dr. De Rosere. And um, she is a graduate from the Contemporary Learning and Interdisciplinary Learning Program at Fordham University. Go Fordham Rams. And for those who don't know, I am also a Fordham graduate. So I feel honored to have the opportunity uh, to connect with another Fordham, another Fordham grad. Um, she is an entrepreneur and a world traveler. She's had the chance to take her students to places like Denmark and Sweden and an educator committed to a culturally relevant curriculum and pedagogy and creating a space for our students and for our leaders uh, to know their history and uh, to know the things that they need in order to inspire them to move forward. So thank you so much for joining us uh, today. And let me give you the chance to introduce yourself as well and to ask the question around you know, what are some of the things that you think that, it, that we have um, uh, forgotten in our journey that we need to understand as we uh, move forward? Thank you so much for having me, Dr. B. Um, it's always a pleasure to meet a fellow Ram, a fellow Black woman, a fellow Black doctor, a fellow Black artist. Um, I find myself in all of these spaces. Um, and so it's a pleasure to be able to kind of be um, in community around things that are important to all of us in the ways that we, we approach our history and our heritage. So for me, um, I am Dr. Anne de Rosier. Uh, I am a world traveler, as Dr. B mentioned. I am an educator. I taught at all segregated schools in New York City. I taught high school, I taught middle school, and I taught history. So I've taught global history and I also taught American history. I also taught advanced placement US history um, under the AP for All program, which was a program dedicated to expanding um, access to advanced placement courses to inner city students. Um, and so when we talk about black history, I think for me, a lot, a lot of it is, is, is actually forgotten, I think, because really black history is American history. It's not, it, it, it's not mm -hmm. something that we, we, you know, Carter G, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, excuse me, founded, um, you know, Negro History Week in 1926. And it was his hope that one day we wouldn't need to just have a month because the, you know, everybody who is not black would realize just the contributions that we've made to this country, but we're still in the, in the depths of denial. And it's, it's kind of ridiculous almost, right? To see that we still have to push so hard for acknowledgement and recognition in what we've done. Um, I think, you know, as a, as a, as a historian and somebody who's taught the subject, I think there is a very critical time in American history that a lot of people do not teach in schools and that is reconstruction. And I did a lot of work with my students always um, every year to kind of unpack the years following the Civil War from 1865 to 1877, because a lot of Black history was born during Reconstruction. You know, it was at that time, not now, it was then where we had the most African American representation in Congress, um, in United States history. You know, we're still trying to fight and claw our way back into the halls of, of government and politics, but there are very much 
many individuals who died, you know, simply so that we could vote, who, who um, communities, communities in Louisiana, communities in Oklahoma that were massacred simply for exercising their right um, to, to vote. And so for me, if I could pinpoint, I mean, I think all of it is important, but if I could pinpoint a time that's really much forgotten by most people, it would be reconstruction. In addition to the debate between, um, you know, immigrant, uh, immigrant African American or immigrants of the diaspora being black, so black um, Caribbean descendants and also black African Americans. You know, we have a very rich tradition of working together um, in American history, and we have a very rich tradition of making a lot of waves. You know, as a collective and not as a and not being divided. And I think a lot of this conversation has been kind of coming up um, as of late. You know, um, it's it's an enduring conversation around the black experience and how the immigrant black experience is different than the um, Ados black experience. Um, Ados being African descendants of slaves, and we were all slaves. You know, we were all just a different stop on the boat. So, you know, I think <laughs> I think we need to kind of kind of come together and realize that people like Marcus Garvey, who you know yeah. was of you know, there are a lot of historical black history figures that were from the Caribbean, and we always had a tradition of working together. So, okay. I told everybody, hey, this is our chance to have this discussion and <laughs> we we're off, right? And um, I so appreciate that. Thank you so much. I just saw that Dr. Doswell just joined and um, I want to make sure that you're able to, um, to connect well, Dr. Doswell. So if you want to at any point, um, if you're having some technical issues, send me a note. Um, for those who are just joining us, please make sure to like and subscribe. And we're here today to talk about um, Black history and uh, Black excellence. As I think about that question as well, I also think that, that, that we need a better understanding of our history. And we seem to only know that we were uh, slaves. And I really would rather us think of us being enslaved and to know that uh, we right. had a history before, which has really allowed us to be sustained um, and, and, to, and to still be here, to uh, be able to say that uh, we have a history, uh, you know, building, build, building the pyramids. We have a history um, in art. We have a history that um, has carried us uh, through the slave experience. And yes, as a mathematician, I think we also have to understand um, in terms of the fact that this divide that exists um, throughout Pan-Africa, that it was very intentional. And you know, as a slave, if you were on a slave ship, you just so happened to be dropped in Cuba or you just so happened to be dropped off in Brazil or you happened to be dropped off in the Geechee Islands, right? That that was not in any way something, uh, you know, well, well planned and strategized. And so um, we, we are actually uh, individuals who have had different slave experiences in these different places, but it's important to know our history and, um, and that divide is something that as we look to the future, we need to do a better job educating our children here as well as our children throughout, um, throughout Pan-Africa. Um, I wanna welcome Dr. Doswell uh, to the conversation. Thank you so much, Dr. Doswell for making time uh, to be with us and to, um, to share uh, your experiences and your expertise. Uh, Dr. Doswell is the Vice President of the Negro Leagues uh, Museum. And before you joined Dr. Doswell, I said to them that this conversation is selfish for Dr. B because I love sports and I absolutely do love baseball as well. So <laughs> we appreciate you uh, taking the time to share your expertise uh, with us today. And um, I want to point out, which is really interesting to me, that you have a degree in Historic Resources Management. And when I saw that, as we talk today, oftentimes if you're a parent, we think that you only have to do the traditional careers. So if you're listening and you have a young person in your life, here's somebody who has a degree, right, in, in, a, in an area we would not expect. So Dr. Doswell, let me let you introduce yourself to the audience. And our question also, if you give us a moment to share, what does it mean to know Black history um, for you? And um, are there significant moments in the journey that you think are often forgotten or misunderstood? Well, thank you. And uh, thanks for allowing me to join you today. Um, 
um, I was late because I was technically in Portland, Oregon, <laughs> right before this uh, presentation, uh, among many that we're doing this month. So, um, yeah, so my, I'm a teacher by training, um, a high school social studies teacher, world history, uh, world geography, uh, but learned about um, what we we don't usually use term historic resources management much. It's more public history is, is a uh, term that is more commonly used if you are looking a young student and you're a historian and you see public history programs. Uh, that is what you ought to be looking for if you want to do something outside of a classroom or a college setting with your history degree and not become a lawyer or something else. So um, public history is working in uh, museums and archives. Now, sometimes those are private, uh, like you could work in a corporate archive, like companies like Anheuser-Busch or, or uh, PepsiCo, who owns a lot of different products, not just Pepsi soft drinks, but at one point, Kraft Foods and all of those people have been doing, those companies have been around for years collecting material uh, that they use in advertisement and things like that. And so they need archivists and people like that to manage that material. Or even Wells Fargo Bank has just been around since the stagecoach days, has a museum and archives that they collect things both for their own personal business records, but also uh, from a historical standpoint, uh, because they've been around for decades and decades. Uh, but you can also work in a public museum like the Smithsonian or uh, art museum or in most in my case history museums like the baseball museum uh, and um, that includes a number of different jobs uh, uh, from the care and maintenance of the actual artifacts and collections to the writing if you're a historian and writing an interpretation of those materials photos and things well you have to explain what all this stuff is to the wider audience to, so that they can understand it. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you are writing dissertations every day, uh, but it, and actually what you're trying to do is make what scholars have written about a particular topic more palatable for everyone else. Uh, we, and, and sometimes in museum world, we have to be reminded of this, is that we really have to write uh, our interpretations for people who were probably between a sixth and 10th grade level and 10th grade is kind of high. That's just so the general public can see what they want when they come to them to a museum. Uh, and, uh, and if they want to learn more that they can go into these more advanced uh, readings and other things. So that includes uh, public history, includes archives, it includes working in museums, it includes uh, restoring historic buildings. Uh, it includes um, um, uh, just watching for historic lands as well. And of course, uh, there's a big movement uh, in African-American history and African-American preservation to preserve these places of memory across the country. Historic houses uh, like Emmett Till's home in mm -hmm. Chicago, family home, which technically has nothing to do with the situation and story of Emmett Till as that situation happened in Mississippi mm -hmm. uh, with him. But as a landmark, the community there has decided that they want to preserve that story for the rest of the community. So his home uh, has recently been nominated to be on the National Historic Register. So these are the types of things that if you're interested in history and um, you don't necessarily want to be in the classroom or in a college setting, uh, there, there are opportunities out there for you. And even if you're not interested in history, museums and these places need people who are artists and graphic designers and other things. So there's opportunities for you. I just have been fortunate to be here for, uh, wow, 25 years. <laughs> okay. Saying that out loud is kind of interesting. Um, <laughs> and I've uh, been working, and I wouldn't say that I'm even an expert on Negro Leagues history or even baseball history. My training was mostly in jazz and work songs and things like that. But I am a baseball fan, and I do appreciate the connections between sports and our and our past. Um, and um, more, huh? No, I said we as we were getting started, we were also making those connections in terms of. So I so appreciated you giving a context of the Emmon Hill piece and this idea of kind of preserving, right? Preserving, preserving history. Um, 
and uh, we want to give a chance also to learn a little bit more about the Negro, you know, the Negro League uh, Museum and the, and the work that, um, you know, that you've also uh, been engaged in there, because I know that you've also recently, um, you know, recently expanded. Um, I want to give um, artist Griffin a chance to, to kind of jump, jump in here. And I wanted to ask her if you can talk a little bit about the role of art in, in kind of shaping and, and our individual and, and collective understanding um, of Black history Thank and you. how does that inform our identity? I would love to comment on that. Um, so after doing um, my research to help me to be able to create my exhibit, um, and please take note, I just launched my first solo art exhibit uh, in 2020 at the Black Archives, and it's titled Our Ancestors Unfinished Stories in America on a Line. And I was very detailed um, and I was honored because my ancestors, um, believe it or not, intervened and I was instructed to shut myself off for 21 days to be able to put this exhibit on. But please take note, the 21 days led to 30 days and I'm glad that I shut myself off and that was no social media, no contact. Um, the way I spelled it, it was little letters un and finish was all capitals but I also made a, America with a little A because as a woman of color, I'm still literally not accepted in America in a manner that I need to be. And then I spell line in all caps. Um, so to do this exhibit, it is especially as far as Afro-American woman of color, to do an exhibit to that collaboration, I had to do a lot of research and I took it as far as I could back to Ida B. Wells I took it as far as back to lynching when she went overseas and talked about it. My whole exhibit was on, believe it or not, it was on posts with rope and burlap. That's how I put the exhibit together. It was not hung up on the wall, even though I wanted to hang it on the wall, yeah. but I was instructed to no, do not hang it on the wall. It was all again, it was, all, it was rope, clothespins, posts, um, because it was, Billie Holiday, you know, she even played a great role in me putting on this exhibit. Even Nina Simone played a role, you know, uh, if I can say Mississippi, you know, they're part of the song, but as yeah. African-American, as an artist, it's, as Nina Simone said, and I, this is where I got the statement from, it is my divine duty as an artist to be, have the opportunity to express myself. So I'm going to express it because some of us can't say it or we're too scared to say it because we haven't did our research or want to learn. So to do research and, and backing up what Dr. Doswell said and Dr. Anne, Anna is like, you gotta research. And for me to be able to cre create these pieces, it's, it hurts sometimes um, because I know what I'm doing, but when people don't get it and they ask questions, it lets me know that you have not really tapped into your research in a manner that you need to. Um, Cause I did um, 1619, I did the slave ship. Um, it's 130 inches long. And um, let me tell you, it took three months to do it. And when I got done, I got the initial tap on my shoulder. And I kid you not, I got the initial tap on my shoulder to tell me good job. And I literally laid out in my studio floor when I got it done. So, so um, as an artist, it, it can be a challenge. And I so appreciate that because I think what we're making the disconnection is that scholarship is an important part of this work that, that you know, we can't just say we want to, you know, that, that this is our moment in history and that we awake mm. and not want to put in the, the, the efforts in terms of, of learning. For those who are just joining us, uh, you are part of our conversation on Black history and Black excellence. So thank you for staying with us and calling a friend. Make sure you like, um, you know, you like and, and also uh, subscribe. Um, I want to ask, um, Dr. Um, De Rosere, a question about uh, when you think about our schools and our educators, um, if they want to consider um, if they're going to create this learning culture that values Black history, what do you think we need to go about uh, doing? And then I'm going to come back to, um, to Dr. Doswell. So uh, Dr. De Rosere. Yeah, so I think that's a really great question. I think I think there are a couple of kind of headlines if, if we're going to talk about um, school leadership and, and, and creating a culture of Black history and Black excellence. And I think the first one is that we, um, we can't wait. I think 
there is a, a impetus to say the curriculum is whitewashed and we know that. We know that the curriculum is not about us. It doesn't include us. It doesn't include a lot of people of color, not just black people, but it doesn't include you know, the, the tradition of Chinese immigrants and Indian immigrants and all the people that came that were brought over as workers to build very critical functions of our infrastructure. So, you know, for me, I think it's super important um, in the in the space of education for teachers and for school leaders to prioritize and make space for, you know, Black people to be included in the work and not just included because it's February, but included because that's the subject and we have had a stronghold in all the subjects that we teach. We have a lot of Black scientists. You know, it was a Black woman that created the home alarm system that we use right now. Um, you know, there are so many contributions that African Americans and Africans um, have made in the history of the world. And if we had just, if we just take the time to prioritize including these figures in everyday classes and everyday subjects, we'll see a change in how students see history differently and how students perceive what they can be. When we talk about STEM, you know, we talk about we need to do STEAM, we need to do STEM. And really the fact of the matter is no child is gonna wanna do something that they have not been exposed to. No child is gonna see themselves as a, Nobel, as a Nobel Peace Prize winner if they did not know that they could be one. And so, you know, I think the priority cannot rest on other people to influence the curriculum. We have to adapt curriculum in real time to incorporate the voices of black, brown, indigenous people of color throughout the things that we teach. The second thing, I'll, yeah, this, I just wanna add one more thing about, about the culture piece. I think um, a lot of school leadership and educational leadership I, I said this, I, I was on the panel yesterday and I, and I said that I think what a lot of people need to realize is that education is rooted in the norms of white upper class hegemony. So a lot of the things that we, when we talk about parental involvement, when we talk about, um, you know, assessing, when we talk about um, discipline, a lot of these things come from the lens of the fact that schools are run that of, from a white upper class culture dynamic. And it's not run from a dynamic of what we do and how we act at home. And so there's a big disconnect there. And I think it's very important for school leaders and for teachers, more school leaders in this case, to examine how a lot of the cultural norms at schools reflect the school to prison pipeline. How a lot of the things that we come to discipline our students on, maybe they don't need discipline in that, in that specific space how we talk to our kids. You know, a lot of what we do at home needs to be accepted and, and celebrated in the, school, in the school's um, culture because that's where our kids spend a lot of their time. And so a lot of the conflicts are not coming because there's a disconnect. And the disconnect is because we haven't just fall, you know, yeah. taken a step back to acknowledge that a lot of this is like, whoa, like this isn't, this isn't culturally rooted in how we are as a people naturally. And so there's gonna be even more pushback if we're enforcing systems that haven't come from us and that weren't born of us. Oh, well said. And I, I, I absolutely agree because the system was not designed to educate you, right? And, and was not designed uh, you know, for a space for our children. Um, well said. I wanna go back to, uh, to Dr. Doswell and I wanna uh, give you a chance, Dr. Doswell, to just give us a context about the Negro Leagues um, Museum and its significance in, in sports and in, in American history. And um, I'm gonna do a shameless um, uh, piece because I'm so honored because I, I had the pleasure of working with um, Mr. Ed Charles, uh, the slider from the Miracle Mets. And he was just this dynamic figure and, um, and person. And I met him later on in his career after he had retired and he had made a real commitment to young people um, in the community. And so I was excited to have the chance to connect with you today. So Dr. Doswell, tell us about the Negro Leagues Museum, if you can, for our audience who, um, who have heard of it, but may not truly understand the nature of, of, of what you do. So the museum was founded in 1990 by a group of um, historians and business people and enthusiasts as well as former baseball players to try to establish um, an institution uh, locally, but with the national and international context because um, the Negro Leagues baseball is a story that's steeped in the diaspora and especially in the great migration story. 
uh, of Af as African Americans are moving around the country and, and from the rural to urban to the southern to midwestern and northern creating these cultural enclaves <clears throat> that would become our black neighborhoods and our major black cities uh, building their own businesses against the backdrop of, of segregation. Uh, and among those businesses, like their schools, their churches, and banks, and bakeries, and other things, uh, was the small business of baseball, which was popular among many ethnic groups across the country, um, um, and it was becoming more of an industrialized entertainment uh, in the late 1800s through the 1920s uh, and 30s, um, and African Americans wanted to play and enjoy that and make money off of it too. So they tried to create their own business teams and leagues um, uh, and individual black people played on what you might call white major leagues in the 1800s, but all black teams were not allowed to join those leagues. Um, never a written rule to say that they couldn't, just collusion against them mm -hmm. to prevent them from joining. So they tried to do their own thing and be entrepreneurs and ultimately that led to the creation of successful leagues starting in 1920, um, in part as a reaction to all the things that were happening to African Americans, the Red Summer, the, uh, the end of the war, the, the pandemic back then and other things. Um, the Negro National League formed uh, at a meeting here in Kansas City in February of 1920, 101 years ago. Um, and from there, these teams traveled across the country uh, playing thrilling baseball, entertaining black and white fans up through the Great Depression where it folded shortly and then rebounded after that uh, up through World War II uh, and um, to a point where uh, uh, um, the movement more, it became more progressive to try to think really seriously about integration of society and especially sport. And uh, that's when a young man named Jackie Robinson comes on the scene in around 1942, 1945, uh, and uh, plays in the Negro Leagues in Kansas City, earns an opportunity to play, uh, gets recruited to white baseball, and then uh, integration of baseball begins to happen. But the Negro Leagues soldier on between, between that period up through 1960. Wow. And here at the museum, we chronicle that history through photographs and artifacts and um, educational programming. Um, and um, um, just echoing what the previous speaker said, you know, it's important to get beyond February because we're, this museum's open every day of the year. And so you could come learn about this history and the impact of these ballplayers, certainly beyond February and certainly beyond Jackie Robinson. And Jackie Robinson is 1942, but uh, Satchel Page is 1920s for those who don't know, right? So this. Well, actually, a little bit later. Uh, later. He doesn't go back that far, and that's what people need to remember. Page is actually more of a contemporary Robinson, although he was just a little bit older than him. Um, uh, but Page is kind of the, the greatest entertainer and player of the second half of the Negro Leagues history. There were so many others before him uh, that were successful. And then also Paige does get a chance to go to play Major League Baseball in 1948 himself. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for clarifying that timeline. Um, I, um, I do think that especially when we say it shouldn't be just for the month, so many of our children are interested in sports. And they only see, right, this piece of, oh, I want to, you know, I want to be Michael Jordan. I want to, and, and that's perfectly okay to, to love it, um, but to not, um, to not teach them about it, to not have a level of scholarship about it uh, is absolutely, uh, to me, a denial of self and will limit in the, the, the true uh, greatness of our children and, and their future because, um, you know, they need to be able to make those connections and to be able to see that what they do is connected and so that they can make better decisions as players as well as as members um, you know, of, our, of our community. And yes, this year with this whole um, experience around Black Lives Matter, we, we saw several of our sports um, athletes or whatever step up and, and find a voice, but it took them um, you know, a while uh, to do it, right? To be able to have that, have that courage. Uh, we are certainly in a pandemic, so I wanna be able to also um, 
make that connection around what our artists and our entrepreneurs are experiencing. And so I want to ask um, artist Griffin, if you can kind of give a context of how COVID-19 has impacted the Black artist and the, and the community um, in, this, in this season. Oh, great question. Thanks for asking that. Um, I would have to say, and speaking on my behalf, I'm, I'm a new artist to the game right now. So I have to say it's probably a much bigger increase because now we don't have to just be local in our neighborhoods, in our communities. Now you can go across the world, which I think is a beautiful thing. Last Friday, I was just in California doing a presentation, which I think it makes it even better. But the beauty of it is, is for most artists, our artwork is, is soaring high now because everybody wants some black art. Everybody, it, here's the crazy part. It's been out there. But it's sad that we have to get to this point for you to actually see what's behind the scenes. And that's for me to actually see what's behind the scenes. But I had to take a step out on faith for myself. And I pretty much, I just make phone calls. I go to different organizations and be like, can I do a pop-up exhibit? They're like, yes, which I think makes it even better because at one time you weren't able to get into these institutions or get into these places, but now they want you there um, because they want, they want the audience. And I, it's a, it's a plus. Um, the sad, the downside is you're moving 24/7. Um, just yesterday, I just wrote up two proposals to go into two organizations that I know for a fact that probably would have not even at, thought to ask me. So I would have to say for uh, African American artists right now, it's it's soaring. Uh, I don't know if you guys are following Najee Dorsey, um, Black Art in America. I love that dude. I've been watching him for a long time, and I remember he was here in Kansas City. And he made a perfect statement. He was at an art festival and people just walked past him, didn't even pay any attention. Now everybody's like, doom, doom, doom. They're, they're knocking at the door. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's a good part um, going back to what the other doctors have said, which I think is awesome. is like, don't wait till February. I, I, my skin is this color 365 days a year. And I have been posting on my Instagram before Black History Month, it was this. Yes. Before and then when we get done with Black History Month, I'm gonna put after Black History Month. It was this. this, so it's still it's still. So even for my my exhibit, uh, like I said, it was up for three months, and now people are saying, "Hey, I, I want to see your exhibit," and I'm like, "I'm sorry, my ancestors that already been there, done that, and they moved on to something else." Um, but if somebody still wants to see it, I let them see it. But it, at the same note, yes, Black History is American history. I just wish we were to recognize that. Uh, and just with all the other cultures too, it's history. It's, it's history in America, but just respect those, give them honor all. Uh, and what a lot of people fail to realize, and, and I'm sorry, I, somebody's talking to me. Uh, it all started in 1724, when, every, when everybody really wanted to get ready before we had a month and it happened here in Kansas City, we had a Sunday, baby. Yes. We had one day a week and it was a Sunday and I did a piece called 1724 called Freedom. Well said. And, it's, and, it, and it was based off of Congo Square where they would go to and connect, communicate, talk, chill, learn. And that was their form of communication. One day, just one. And that was in 1724. And it's such so, a big community in Kansas City. I mean, in different communities, um, you know, as well. And I think we also don't understand different communities and, 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 and how, uh, for example, Kansas City has contributed to African and American history and to American uh, history. Most people don't know about the Geechees and, and, you know, in the South. And even now they're being impacted a lot by global, uh, global warming and flooding and things like that. And so, yes, I'm excited that they are connecting more to our history, but I don't want people to see it as the flavor of the month. I think that there has to be a commitment on our leaders and on our educators to understand that we can't be the flavor of the month and that people have to truly show up and now do the work of knowing who you are. And, mm -hmm. you know, there are several entrepreneurs on here and people called me and, you know, the past couple of months are like, oh, Dr. B, did you know there was a Black Wall Street? And, um, and I'm like, yeah, why didn't you know? Not in a bad way, but to kind of have that <laughs> aha that you need to now make a commitment, mm -hmm. knowing your history and absolutely not just um, African-American history, but to understand how we all connect and all struggle and those experiences. Right. I want to ask, um, Dr. DeRosaway, um, if you would uh, speak a little bit too about what would you suggest to a parent or a caregiver 
who might want to spark the interest of our young people, given your work in curriculum and in education? Maybe, you know, what's one thing that a parent can do to begin to inspire and to support their children in this process? And before you do that for our audience, uh, please, you can, uh, those who are listening, thank you so much for joining us. I'm hoping that uh, you are commenting in the in the chat. And yes, Dr. B always takes questions. And so tell us your question uh, for Dr. Doswell, for our artist, um, uh, Karen uh, Griffin. She's also a storyteller. So I wanna hopefully get that question <laughs> in. And for our, um, our educator and educational uh, leader, Dr. Uh, DeRosoe. So Dr. DeRosoe, what can, what's one thing that a parent, that a parent or a caregiver or someone in a child's network of care can do? Yeah, so I think um, we are fortunate enough to live in the information age like none other. Um, and I think it's super important to know that along, along with the, the, the reckoning of Black Lives Matter and kind of it being more public, because um, back, you know, those things were happening for a long time. We have a lot of um, books at our disposal. Um, if you just Google Queens, you know, of Africa, you'll find so many stories. And, and you know, I know Karen is a, is a storyteller and I think young people love stories. And so I think by engaging young people in storytelling around people that even if you didn't know, like use that as a teachable moment to say, hey, did you know about, um, you know, Makita? Did you know about, um, you know, so many princesses I'm like blanking out at the moment because I just looked up a few of them myself but yes yeah you can do that and also um there are black history flashcards there are a variety of companies that that sell them um and so I'm not gonna you know name anyone but if you like to me there are those are the two ways it's kind of just making it into story time doing a, a, a quick google search and identifying every week we'll do a we'll do a different queen we'll do a different king um, supporting with black, you know, black history flashcards and definitely the library getting, you know, getting books that center um, black historical figures or just black central or uh, black main characters. I think it's really important to see, to, to surround ourselves um, in traditional, with traditional uh, modalities with people that look like us. So be it, you know, watching shows from back in the day, you know, that that honor blackness and honor black culture. So these are a few different ways that I would recommend if you're a caregiver or a parent, you can kind of make this a regular recurring theme um, in the home, so. Uh, thank you, thank you so much for that. Um, I wanna ask Dr. Doswell, um, I wanna ask you, I guess I want to have a context of how you've been impacted um, by uh, COVID-19 and I'm not sure, if, and, and I do say that to my panel members, we can certainly respond to other things that, that the panel members say, but uh, are you open um, uh, for guests, um, Dr. Doswell? Are we doing more things online? Uh, so how do we go about connecting with the Negro Leagues uh, Museum? And uh, when we do go there, what would you suggest? How do we you know, get started in learning from the rich uh, pieces and artifacts and, and, and the history uh, when we do have a chance to visit, visit your museum? So the museum is open with safety protocols. Um, we've been open since June of last year um, with just one brief hiccup in December. Um, so we're not doing group tours or like school group tours though. So we, but families and others can come. There's no reservations per se, you just, um, but uh, we share a building with the American Jazz Museum. So you make a reservation to be in the building and then you can choose which museum or both that you want to go to. Um, we have abbreviated hours than we would normally have, but uh, for the most part, the experience is still the same. When we were closed, we took advantage of that time to actually add new exhibits uh, and we continue to tweak and adjust things as we move along. We have a museum store as well that folks can shop online or can visit in person to buy merchandise or books or videos related to the history. Um, we had purposely not done a lot of virtual programming initially. We didn't jump right into that. We wanted to wait. And primarily because it's, I'm, with education, it's just me. I don't have enough help to do some of the demand that we were getting. <laughs> Uh, but we purposely targeted February to start getting back into doing some things and, and learning the tech and things like that. So, but since then I've been busy every day, uh, but also all the different news stories that came out, especially near the end of last year has kept us busy. Um, 
we were involved in, at least from a sports standpoint, trying to contextualize the social unrest historically. Um, we were turned to for that. Uh, last year was the, technically the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Negro League. So we had that going on. And then we had so many losses among black baseball players, um, some of them Negro leaguers, but some of them major black players from the major leagues. And, and unfortunately, every time something happened, we got a call and there were just so many, even uh, when um, the actor Chadwick Boseman died, who played Jackie Robinson on screen, um, there was a lot of demands on our time to talk about that legacy. So uh, we've been extremely busy. Uh, and uh, but and baseball season is about to start uh, for Major League Baseball so that we expect to be continue to be busy uh, through the spring and hopeful that it's safe enough that fans can come. Because that was the one thing we missed mm-hmm. was having baseball fans come into the museum. Uh, but I, I can say that since the pandemic, I've never been busier in my life. Well, that's a good, that, that's a, that's a good thing. And, um, <laughs> it's a good problem. <laughs> it's a good problem. Yes. It's, but good problem. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's still difficult to manage sometimes, but we certainly appreciate the attention. <laughs> um, I want to ask another question of, um, the art piece, um, uh, artist Griffin, and I know that you're also a storyteller. So yeah. uh, you mentioned the fact that now you're, you've seen this explosion of people interested in art, but art yes. and, and our activism as a community go, go hand in hand. Mm-hmm. And so where would you, as you look to the future and, and, and kind of capturing this, this, this experiences that we have here, what have you noticed by way of maybe shifts in, in, if, in how the artists go about, you know, telling, um, and capturing what we're experiencing in this in this time period, and if it's not the artist, then how have you maybe uh, conceptualized, um, you know, helping us to make sense of the time period that we're in now? Um, it, and so, if we're speaking on behalf of artists, is um, and this is something else I was listening to is um, it's best right now for artists to continue to stay in that creative mold um, because this will lift eventually. Um, we hope that our audience can still follow follow us after this mode has lifted, but it's best to stay connected and create and communicate much as possible. I would have to say during this epidemic, I didn't even know there was that many black artist groups out there. Um, I just connected with one in Florida and they were like, we really want you to be on our team. And I'm thinking, how did you find me? And again, you know, Gazo said, it's during this epidemic, I'm amazed how you're busier now than we were before, because it's like, everybody wants to be a part of it. But to see where we're gonna go, I just hope that, yes, the epidemic has brought it together. I just hope that we don't get to where now we don't separate because we'd have made it through this that we separate if we can forget. Um, If I could, I would just like to share a piece from um, someone that I have been following, if I may, um, to help you understand how I got art and storytelling together Um, And I didn't even, I didn't even realize that I could put these two gifts together because I have them separated, but I decided to put these two gifts together. And I think that's what inspired me. So I would like to do a piece of a woman that um, inspired me to get to where I am right now. If you guys don't mind, you guys okay with that? Absolutely. We would love to hear that. Absolutely. (laughs) Thank you. And as I mentioned, when Dr. Doswell um, came on, as we kind of steady your, um, your, your Wi-Fi, uh, we want to, um, as a company, we work very hard to help our educators and our leaders um, create a, a space where our kids can find their purpose and their passion. So to say that you are a storyteller, that's not professions that our children and, and that we think it's okay mm-hmm. to do sometimes, right? So yes, yeah, so let me right. give you chance to share a piece for our audience <laughs> here, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and so to our audience, we thank you. So let me pass it over to um, Artis Griffin. Thank you. And so please take note um, to uh, Dr. Ann, thank you for the education part. Um, Cause I'm a part of Nepster and Connector and KC Prep here in Kansas City. So when I go into the classroom, we do career jumping, which is awesome. When I do those, I go straight into character. So I dress in vintage wear to let the children know, look, I'm not this, this, and this, but I'll ask them, what do you think my job career or my title is? 
And so when I tell the children that I have four job careers or four job titles, they're like, wow, how is that possible? I said, because you have to realize the word job only has three letters. The word careers has multiple letters, which means I'm going to get multiple checks. You only get 26 <laughs> checks with a job. You're going to get multiple checks because you have expanded yourself. I like so that. When I, you know what I mean? And you, and you have to I break it, it out to them. And then they're like, oh, my God, I love it. Uh, and they've asked me, so which one is your favorite? And I said, all of them, because I get paid for all of them. But when I tell them that I'm a storyteller, when I tell them that I'm a textile or a fiber artist, when I'm telling them that I'm a radio host, host, when I tell them I'm a certified international tour manager, they're like, what? And I'm like, you can be whatever you want activity. to be. That is really it's, it's just, it's just like, you know, I, I had to keep telling myself I am. I am just as good as today as I was yesterday. And well, so with that being said, uh, let me give you a piece from a woman who I've been studying to help me get to where I am. And let's just say when this woman showed up, she showed up and showed out and took over me completely. Um, one was Zora, but I'll tell you the, who the next is after I give her piece, okay? Okay, all right, we've got enough to do. I think we've got about eight, or, eight to 10 minutes. Go right ahead. Okay. So as I sat on the train, I sat in my seat gently in the seat with the rest of the ladies. The Pullman came through and asked me for my ticket. I gently handed him my ticket and he looked back at me and said, excuse me, ma'am, but you're gonna have to move to the back of the train. Well, I told him, sir, excuse me, sir, but I prefer to sit here with the rest of the ladies. Ain't I a woman? The next thing I know, he placed his hand up on my shoulder and tried to pull me up out of my seat. Well, I felt as a lady, I placed my teeth into the back of his hand. Next thing I know, another pullman comes through and they're wrestling me and they're pulling me out of my seat. That was a little thing. I wasn't no more than 120 pounds. All the other passengers on the train started to cheer and roar them on as they moved me from the train. I decided to sue. I sued the train company and I won $500. Please take note, the Tennessee Supreme Court overruled and I only won three. You see, my money is good enough to buy me what I want and what I need. But my skin color stops me from being a part of America that I was brought to against my wishes. This woman um, is Ms. Uh, Ida B. Wells. Ida B. Wells taught me a lot. And I was admired when I found out this woman went overseas yes. in 1800, 19, 1893 and 1894 to be exact, I believe, to tell them they're whipping them for the cotton that you're wearing. They're lynching them for the cotton that you're wearing. Cause you never heard about our ancestors being beaten cotton field cause they didn't want to damage that product. You don't get no blood on that product. And that was the reason why I did the exhibit title, Our Ancestors, Unfinished Stories in America on the Line because our stories will never be finished until the last black man die. Our stories will never be finished. So, uh, Thank you so That's much. So um, I want to ask you, um, I'm going to give a final question to the audience members. And I just want to ask you before I do that, tell us where to find you, please. And thank you so much for that inspirational piece. Um, You're uh, welcome. Beautiful as we come to a close. Um, so tell us where to find you, um, Artist Griffin. <laughs> So you can find me on IG at Arts by E. Lewis. That is, that is my favorite platform out of all platforms is IG. The artists love IG because we can connect and communicate. Okay, that's Instagram for those who don't know. <laughs> that's Instagram. Instagram. Yes, it's Instagram. <laughs> and then um, you can find me on LinkedIn at Karen E. Griffin on LinkedIn. Thank you so, thank you so much. Um, and thank so my you. final audience, um, uh, my, final, my final question um, for each member, just a literally one minute answer. I always want to know, um, you know, what does, um, if you could just give us a quick summary of what does black excellence, um, you know, mean to you as we, as we come to a close. Dr. Doswell, I'm going to go to you first. Black excellence means to you. Always. 
I like to use the phrase, legacy is greater than currency. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's always going to be more about what you put into something than what you get out of it. And so, and if you do that, then excellence will follow. Oh, wow. Thank you so much. And thank you, Dr. Goswell. And we can find you. The museum is still, is still open. I know that you're also on, on LinkedIn. Um, and the website for the Negro um, Leagues Museum is? Is nlbm.com. NLBM.com. So for those who are listening, and we've got, you know, spring break coming up. We don't necessarily want people um, not being safe, but it's great to know that you're open it. And we look forward to, um, to visiting it as well. And I want to say thank you for lending your expertise. And now to Dr. Uh, DeRosere. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Black excellence. What does it mean uh, to you? And also please tell us where to first tell us where to find you. And then if you can answer the question. So you can find me on IG. I am call me doctor. So call me D-R-C-O, uh, all one word. That's at IG. Um, call me Dr. Co. I'm also on YouTube. Um, I have a YouTube channel called uh, Call Me Doctor, but uh, I have a series called Dr. Ann's Desk, where I try to support, you know, troubleshoot remote learning and virtual learning. I'm on LinkedIn as well. And my website is call me doctor, all spelled out, dot co. So those are the places you can find me. Um, Black excellence to me, we have a saying, uh, I don't know if this was true for you, Dr. B, but when we were, um, when we were going through school at Fordham, my professors often said that the way that you write your literature is that you're standing on the, sho- on the shoulders of giants. Um, and so for me, Black excellence is walking in the spirit that my ancestors provided me to make a difference for the ones that are going to come behind me and kind of paving that paying that forward um you know i wouldn't be able to do what i do without my own family ancestry i wouldn't be able to do what i do without all the people that braved academia when it wasn't cool and when it was segregation so that i could get a phd um and i wouldn't be able to be the educator that i am without all the all the black and brown educators who came before me and informed my work and so Black excellence is standing on the shoulders of my ancestors' greatness and um, paving the path forward for the next generation. Thank you, thank you so much. And uh, we sincerely appreciate you lending your time and your, um, and your expertise. Uh, to our audiences, um, as I come to a close, on behalf of our partner with Legacy Team, we thank you so much always for making time for us. I wanna share with the audience that we planned actually, um, and a shout out to uh, Josh uh, Derlich, our senior program assistant. We've actually spent uh, some time almost planning out the whole year of our webinar and our Legacy <laughs> So uh, next Thursday morning, we're excited to have uh, Dr. Hudson from Rutgers University, and she is a principal investigator at Rutgers uh, doing a study around the treatment of COVID-19, and um, whereas everyone is talking about the vaccine, so we want to talk also with her about the treatment and the implications for our schools, and that will be on Legacy Ed News at 8.50 next Thursday. Uh, The Dr. V Show will be on Sunday, February 21st. The topic is transformations and so I look forward to having Sunday breakfast with you and yes we will continue our legacy ed news um, at the end of um, on February 25th as well so we thank everybody for constantly making time and you know showing us the love and and making uh, making space uh, for us Uh, for me when I think about this uh, topic of uh, black excellence I think we have to keep our eyes on the prize and um, not get lost in uh, so much of the pain, so much of, uh, of the hurt, so much of, of the things that have pulled us away from our family, uh, from our village. And uh, we, uh, when we are focused and uh, when we have a vision of what we want in our lives um, and, and, and a vision for what we want for our children, I think and know that we achieve, uh, that we achieve greatness. And so for all of those, um, we thank you for uh, celebrating Black history with us. I want to give a special thank you uh, to Dr. DeRosere, who's also a mom. She didn't mention that. So she's also wearing hats. She has a little one at home. So please give the little baby and your family some love. <laughs> 
a di um, artist and storyteller Griffin. And Dr. Doswell, thank you so much uh, for making my day and for helping us. And, 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 and you have to plan your inspiration, people. So plan your inspiration by visiting the Negro Leagues Museum and to support in their effort in, in, in archive and our history. Um, make sure we like and subscribe the channel and you can find us at partnerwithlegacy.com as well. Have a lovely evening. Please continue to, uh, to stay